from Raw and Radical. This is On Display, a podcast about extraordinary women in the arts, their true stories and inspiration. I am Maureen Brodbeck and every episode features a conversation with one great woman in the arts or music. There are dialogues about real life challenges, exploring what it means to be a woman in creativity. Today we are welcoming Dr. Sarah Thornton. She is a writer and sociologist of art and culture, design and people. She is the author of three critically acclaimed books, Club Subcultures, Music, Media and the Subcultural Capital, published in 1996, Seven Days in the Art World, published in 2009, and 33 Artists in Free Acts, published in 2015. She dives deep in the world she investigates for several years, interviewing many people to write her books. 33 Artists in Free Act is divided into free acts, politics, kinship, and crafts, and speaks of the encounter with internationally renowned artists such as Mauricio Catalan, Ai Weiwei, Cindy Sherman, Andrea Fraser, Laurie Simons, and Rashid Johnson. The book is both anthropological and art historical. She was the chief art market correspondent for The Economist. She writes extensively on contemporary art and the art world for the Sunday Times Magazine, The Guardian, The New Statesman, The New Yorker, The Art Forum, and The Art Newspaper. She contributed to numerous radio broadcasts and television programs, and she is also a contributing editor of Culture, the magazine. She just contributed to the book Judy Chicago, New Views, that was just published in 2019. She is also a public speaker and advises cultural businesses on branding and communication strategies. Please welcome Dr. Sarah Thornton. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Hello, Morin. My pleasure to be here. You wrote these two great books. And, Thank uh, you. Yeah. In 33 Artists in Three Days, you said that your goal uh, to write, in writing this book was to understand the art market and what an artist is. And I was wondering your conclusion to the question of what is an artist. So, um, I mean, after finishing Seven Days in the Art World, I still had two big questions in my head. One was, how does this art market really work? And the other was, <laughs> what is an artist? So I actually answered the question for myself anyway about the art market by writing for The Economist magazine. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, and so then I devoted my research, my kind of personal book research to the question, what is an artist? And ended up writing 33 Artists in Three Acts. So the great thing about being an artist is that it is self-defined, mm -hmm. but it's self-defined within reason. So, you know, not anybody could just say I'm an artist and have credibility yep. and the social role and status of an artist. Um, and that tends to be forgotten yeah. um, in more simplistic discussions. So in 33 Artists in Three Acts, look at the way different artists are performing the role and defining the job of the artist. And one of the key things is it's not just a job. It is an identity. And the burden on the identity of the artist is much more difficult than the burden on other roles in life. Yeah. And that I trace back to particularly Duchamp, um, because when Duchamp crystallized ideas around conceptual art, and particularly when he wrote his manifesto around uh, the fountain, um, about how an artist kind of could choose and shift something that was a ready-made object and shift it into the world of art and declare it as art. That is actually kind of like a power, a godlike power yeah. to define things in our social world. And so um, it put extra burdens on the artist um, and extra burdens that have not been uh, available equally to men and women. Yeah. And women have had to struggle much harder for authenticity and credibility in the 1950s and 60s and up until like the women's movement of the early 70s. 
the artist was unquestionably a man, yeah. let alone the great artist. I mean, art, the def, an <laughs> artist was by definition male. Yeah. And the exceptions were uh, hard won and marginalized. And so, you know, 33 Artists and Three Acts really focuses in on believability, mm. which is, you know, what credibility means. Yeah. So, and, and I'm particularly interested in self-confidence and also commanding the confidence of others and how artists go about that. And they do so in very different ways. The book is divided into three parts. Mm. And part one is politics, part two is kinship, and part three is craft. And in each part, I have artists who are antagonists mm. for each other. And um, so some artists recur and they have multiple scenes and other artists kind of make cameos and just have a solo scene. And um, hopefully through this kind of comparison and contrast and this puzzle-like structure, one gathers not an absolute black and white definition, but a, um, a very vivid, enriched understanding of the way some different contemporary artists with international reputations, many of them, but not all of them, um, are playing their game. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating, I think. And this this idea of self-confidence, I think it's so important, especially for women. Have you noticed in all the artists you interviewed um, and met a difference between men and women in regards to self-confidence? Absolutely. Even doing the research and the process of trying to access artists was gendered. So hmm. what I found was that um, it was much harder to obtain interviews with women artists than it was with men artists. And um, whether I approached an artist as um, someone writing a book or I approached an artist as someone writing for The Economist or some of the other magazines I've written for over the years, women were much, much more reluctant to talk to me. And I think it's because the media has treated them very poorly. Mm. And they've been the subject of all sorts of kind of covert sexist harassment and skepticism. Mm. And they just don't want to deal with it. And, you know, if you think about it, like the enfant terrible, the, uh, you know, bad boy artist is like yeah. a heroic figure. Yeah. And the bad girl artist is a slut, you know, that kind of behavior uh, diminishes her reputation, whereas the same behavior in a man augments his reputation. For sure. The rules and strictures around behaving in the right way to be taken seriously as an artist are much more constrained on a woman. And so I think women were much more anxious about being perceived as uh, commercial or self-publicizing um, or, you know, overly or naively open uh, in discussing their work. And then not only were women less um, likely to want to give me interviews, Sometimes when I got in to do the interview, they were much more cagey. So mm. they were much less, much more cautious about what mm. they were willing to say. I mean, one of the criteria for kind of getting in the book is, is like the quality and richness and honesty of the interview. Mm. And if I felt like I was getting a lot of safe, pre-digested answers, yeah. answers they'd given a hundred times before, um, I, I couldn't include it. Yeah. So it was harder work to improve the gender balance in the book, which, I mean, it was published now in 2014 and uh, it's 40% female artists and 60% roughly male artists. And I had wanted 50-50. And... Wow. 
it didn't turn out that way in the end. Yeah. Um, but I have some very strong feminist voices. I have women artist voices of all generations. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, women artists who are much acclaimed, you know, like Cindy Sherman or Marina Abramovich, but also women artists who are not unknown. Yeah. Uh, like Tammy Ray Carland, who's the provost here in San Francisco at the California College of the Arts. So in each act, I have artists who, um, you know, do not make a living from their work. Mm. and who teach or do other kinds of job on the side. Um, but then I also have the, you know, the global celebrities who have become wealthy off the back of their work. Yeah. And um, I'm interested in the different strategies that work for different artists. Yeah. There's a lot of fear and, and worries, it seems, right, around becoming public, the idea of uh, really talking about the work, bringing out the work. And now we really have the term of female artist. And I was wondering if you think that differentiating men to women artists with such a, a name, because um, even in the book, there's a, a chapter with Martha Rosler where she talks about this. I love Martha Ros the, that chapter with Martha Rosler. Oh, my cool. God. Yeah. Martha's so smart and so critical and she really, um, you know, her entire earth has been focused on ideologies and puncturing ideologies of different kinds. So for her, the ideology of the art world or the ideologies of the art world are no different. And so she was one of those artists who really, looked at the world from a sociological point of view and said things that I was desperate for someone to say, mm. even when I didn't, you know, that particular phrasing of it all, mm. um, you know, came across as astonishing. Would you like me to read that bit? Sure. I'd love to. One aspect of the art market that amuses Rosler is the prevailing attitude towards artists' ages. When I was studying art, everything made by an artist under 40 was considered juvenilia. When was the last time you heard that term? She exclaims. Now everyone wants to buy work while it's hot. Indeed, speculators are keen to acquire the coveted early work while it is still cheap. The valuation of art has been inverted by the idea that youth matters, just like in celebrity culture. No one ever used to ask, what's your date of birth? Rosler considers the question to be pernicious. What happens, particularly with women, is that they receive attention when they're young, then they disappear when they are middle-aged, and if they have survived past that, then all of a sudden they are discovered. Louise Bourgeois, Grandma Moses, she says, with mock astonishment. <laughs> you know, the way Martha's played her game is very interesting. Her constituency has been um, as much uh, academic as museum mm. yeah. and uh, very much focused on uh, women and feminism. Mm. And um, for many years, she didn't have a dealer. And then, ooh, I don't know, about eight years ago, she started working with Mitchell Innes and Nash in um, New York, which gave her a different kind of platform. And, um, you know, I'm always saying this to women artists, look, you may not be profit motivated. You may not want to make a lot of money like a lot of men, male artists do. <laughs> male artists are way more money mo motivated. Yeah. So I say, look, you may not want to make a lot of money, but if you don't have a dealer and you don't make anything that can be bought or sold, then you're losing a communications platform. Sure. Because the market is a communications platform. The galleries are publicity machines. The objects move through the world and create conversation as they go. Yeah. And even the auctions are a media platform. Mm. Um, in mm. fact, you could say Sotheby's and Christie's have the biggest media platforms there are. Yeah. You know, they get front page news coverage. Mm. How often do 
exhibitions or gallery shows get that. Hmm. For I mean, sure. The, the only, there are several ways to get the front page of a newspaper. One is to die if you're famous. And two is to get a record price, you know. <laughs> So, um, especially with younger women artists, I'm often coaching them or, and they can ignore me and often do because I'm obviously overly opinionated and, but I, I say, look, think about it, consider it. Oh, you know, you don't, you could give all your money to charity if you like, yeah. you could every, every penny you earn off the sale of your work could be given to like a women's shelter, hmm. could be going to Planned Parenthood. You could send it anywhere you like, hmm. you know, but it's that platform. And also the, even in domestic spaces, certain collectors are like bugles for artists. You know, yeah. they sit on museum boards, they're incredibly sociable and, uh, you know, um, sheltering in place aside, often entertaining a lot in their homes. Yeah. Yeah. And the, what is the a primary topic of conversation? It's what's on the walls. Yeah, of course. You know, and what are what are what are standing the artworks in the room? Yeah. And and having done a lot of interviews with collectors over the years for Seven Days in the Art World, and also you know my other writing for the Economist and things like that, one of the primary reasons why collectors love to collect is you know it gives them something to talk about with their friends. Mm. It isn't yeah. just stock prices. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and also, kind of um, moments of social gathering and the rest of it. You think there is a stigma with money? Because I mean, a lot of uh, liberal professions and profession in creativity, um, people do it with the love, of course. That's there's no question. But often you hear. Uh, oh, I don't do it for the money. It's like money is a really bad thing. And there's a lot, and especially for women, because it's most likely part of the culture we are all raised in. I, I absolutely think it's a stigma. Yeah. I think there is a long-term um, kind of ideological antagonism between um, culture and commerce hmm. or art and money. Well, there are a few things that are more dangerous for an artist's credibility than being seen to be profit motivated. Hmm. Well, if you're a profit motivated artist, then maybe you're just a designer. Hmm. You're no longer an artist. Hmm. You know, these are subtle nuanced distinctions, but that's the way our culture works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know what, uh, what I've found is that men can talk a big talk about, having motivations that are completely in working in another direction to business but you know they're much more likely to run their studios like businesses yeah of course and that in a way women take the ideology a little too seriously hmm. that actually there are strategies for um you know being business like um I mean, the other thing I found is women are much less likely to have um, many assistants. Yeah. They're less likely to enjoy delegating. Mm. They often complain about having to delegate. Whereas the men seem to love it. <laughs> And that really impacts on your productivity. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. In a globalized world, you do need a certain level of production in order to make an impact. Mm -hmm. And so rarity is not necessarily a great thing for your career. No, that's when you're dead, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you want to make enough work. Yeah. to get your ideas and your name and your content out into the world. Yeah. And, you know, we know there's the term local artist is kind of a way to damn with praise. Hmm. You know, oh, he is an important local artist. Yeah. I mean, that is an oxymoron. Yeah. <laughs> right and um you know 
do you want to be an unimportant global artist or an important local artist? I mean, it's, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of uh, uh, amusing, yeah. uh, if it, you know, if it weren't so painful to some people. I think that also um, women embrace notions of purity more strongly than men. Mm. And so it's almost like they don't want to think strategically about their career. Yeah. yeah. Whereas men seem to have less qualms about thinking strategically yeah. about their career. True. True. And I think it is it does have to do with the way we were brought up. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I was not brought up to make any money. Mm. You know, um, maybe I wouldn't be writing about art at all. <laughs> You know, if I was writing about something else, I, uh, you know, have a career like my friend on the other side of the bay in Berkeley, Michael Lewis, you know, who wrote The Big Short and The Blind Side and yeah. and uh, Moneyball and all these um, <laughs> books about men, basically, yeah. that get turned yeah. into Hollywood films. Yeah. I mean, he's an amazing writer and a great storyteller and he, he, he deserves his success, but... Uh, you know, I think there are um, things that we're brought up with from a very young age. Mm. And it, it's hard not to replicate them. Yeah, I sure. definitely, I have caught myself because I have a son and a daughter. And my son is 23 and my daughter is 21. And my, my, my daughter is actually a very gifted fiction writer. She's a very gifted writer. And... Um, in general, I'm like, okay, so, how, but how are you going to make a living out of this, Cora? You know, especially because initially, like as a high school student, it was all poetry, poetry, poetry. And I'm like, ah, okay, well, if you're going to write poetry, you better <laughs> write lyrics, you know, because I don't earn enough money to keep you. And, you, you know, and I am not going to encourage you to marry well. So um, anyhow, but still, and despite this, funnily enough, my son, of course, is very kind of driven by what salary he makes. Mm. He mm. works for a startup, which is actually a social impact startup. So they do a lot of good in the world and they're, they're, um, they kind of uh, try to, through data, validate what different charities are doing, especially in the education sphere. So, nice, yeah. but he's still really concerned and always fighting for a raise. Yeah. You know, my daughter's still a college student, but like, is not the way she thinks even when I complain to her, but also I wonder sometimes I'll catch myself saying things to her like, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't worry about it. Yeah. 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 Whatever. You know, you know, what's you funny. Can, you can live from residency to residency. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, my son who's 12, he, he's really into money and I have no idea where that comes from. He's checking everything. How much does that cost? Why do you spend so much? It's ridiculous. Uh, why this? Why that? And you should keep your money. And this, you want to pay this for that? No way. He check. He just checks everything. And then he also, he said to me the other day, you know, my older sister, I know I'm going to have to take care of her at one point. And I'm thinking, but where does that come from? <laughs> He's 12 years old. Now so that's old. amazing. <laughs> that's I'm like, well, good amazing. for her, but... <laughs> I have no. Well, yeah, I, I only hope my son will take care of my daughter <laughs> because that would be ideal. Um, that's funny. To go back to the part you read, um, then Rosler says, "Women cook, but men are chefs." Do you still believe this? I inquire. It hasn't changed very much. She replies, "Women's art is still women's art, while men art is art." So there is really a couple interesting thing in this parts of the book worth discussing. For me, it's this discussion on the illusion of age, because it is true that there's a lot of art prize for young artists or really established artists. And this whole attraction and fashionability or celebrity culture. And um, I was wondering, what's your point of view on, on age and how it has a, a good impact or a negative impact for women artists? I think it is less extreme than it used to be. Yeah. I think the whole mid-career phase is less extreme than it used to be. Uh, partly because, um, I mean, I think age in, is incredibly determining in society and very unequal with regard to men and women. Mm. 
Yeah. Middle-aged men are usually considered, you know, the, are often in great positions of power. Mm-hmm. Middle-aged women, it really depends on whether they had children or not often. Mm. Middle-aged women who have in any way taken even small breaks for their children are often in a completely different career trajectory. Yep. You are doubly punished for taking a break. Yeah, I don't, I think it's not as bad as it used to be. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think, I do not think it's, I don't think uh, what Rosler says about uh, women's art is true anymore. I do think what she says about seriousness and women's issues is still true. Um, so one of my favorite quotes in this chapter is when she talks about the, how the meaning of seriousness swivels. Mm. It used to be that certain subject matters like women's issues weren't considered significant enough to inspire artwork. Um, and, you know, anything that was too political was perceived as too grave for art and art had to be ambiguous and playful and not didactic. I think that's shifted. I think there's a new role for politicized art. Mm. And that may be particularly in America after the election of Trump, Hmm. because all of a sudden, rather than living in a liberal democracy where everything goes, we're in a proto dictatorship with weird forms of censorship. So the president himself is very censoring by calling things that are factually accurate lies. And the right is constantly duplicitously um, spreading propaganda. You know, so we're in a kind of propaganda war and the propaganda ends up squelching and smothering the truth, which is a kind of strategic form of censorship of the truth oh yeah yeah it's quite scary i think (laughs) yeah Yeah. so i think that um and we'll see what happens you know when hopefully things change but i do think the whole notion of seriousness and what is serious art is a key issue for women when martha rosler did her famous video about called semiotics of the kitchen um, in 1975, I mean, it was reviewed in art form as like a ridiculous housewife thing. Mm. And that would not happen now. Yeah, true. And, and I'm thankful for that. Um, and wonderfully, when you go on YouTube and Google Martha Rosler semiotics of the kitchen, you'll find her semiotics of the kitchen. You'll also find a load of spoof videos mm. of semiotics of the kitchen, yeah, yeah. including Barbie in the kitchen. And yeah. even my daughter did one as an assignment back <laughs> when she was a high school student. I mean, the interesting contrast to Martha Rosler in here is um, Marina Abramovich, mm-hmm. who's... Um, has a different kind of politics and one in which she appears to believe that, um, you know, having a child is an absolutely anathema to having, uh, to being a credible artist. Yeah. Yeah. And I was kind of shocked by what she said. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite different from Rosler who actually does have a son. Yeah, there's quite a lot of successful uh, women artists with uh, children. And more and more, I would say, there's a bit of a generational gap. You know, the kind of um, Yoyoi Kusama, uh, Marino Brown, Cindy Sherman, like these are women who did not have children yeah. for many reasons, let's say. Um, the uh, women under 65, I think, are uh, having children and being an artist is easier Mm. than it was for those women who are now over 65. Mm. Thankfully, times do change. I was wondering what's your view on um, the role of women artists uh, in raising their status in in the art world, because it is a bit more difficult for women, uh, as we already talked about. So 
how much responsibilities uh, do you think uh, you can attribute to the, the artists yeah. themselves? Yeah, thanks. Well, that's interesting. That's a really interesting question because I think that there is an idea out there that things happen to artists, hmm. you know, that they're discovered or, yeah. you know, <laughs> and that they lack agency, mm -hmm. that all they're supposed to do is just focus on their work. Yep. And this is an art school myth. Yep. And many art schools do not pay sufficient attention to the role of the artists in society, the way the art world works, uh, institutional relationships, curator relationships, critic relationships, dealer relationships, all that kind of thing. Hmm. They say, oh, just, just focus on what's with inside the frame. Hmm. And um, I think that is a fallacy. And, you know, an artist's work is everything they do not just what's inside the frame. Mm -hmm. So the way they move through the world and the relationships they establish are important. And artists do have agency. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll encounter a, an artist, let's say in their 50s, who has not had the recognition that they would have liked. And sometimes I think to myself, I'm, oh my God, the only person you can blame is yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Because there's a certain kind of like helplessness, yeah, like a yeah, damsel yeah. in distress kind of quality. Yeah. And it and it's not, <laughs> it's actually not just women who have this. I've met men with it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You it know, is. this weird kind of damsel in distress met with bitterness. Yeah. Like, you know, and I've been asked in the past, what do you what's a successful <laughs> artist? And my answer is, well, I can tell you, I don't know what a successful artist is, but I know what an unsuccessful artist is. An yeah. unsuccessful artist feels bitter. Yeah. And actually, I know really um, well-established multimillionaires who are bitter. Yeah. You know, you could say there are moments when Damien Hirst was bitter. Uh, and and uh, because he felt misrecognized. Mm, mm. he'd been recognized and then he was misrecognized mm. um i mean there's you know an angel that flew too close to the sun perhaps yeah. well you know the, the success is self-defined yes yeah, i wouldn't is. want to generalize on the basis of any one version of success yeah. you know i weigh weigh's version of success is way different from um Isaac Julian's version of success, very different from Jeff Koons or Rashid Johnson or, you know, Wangeshi Mutu or Laurie Simmons or one of my favorite artists and one of the stars of 33 Arts and Three Acts, Andrea Fraser, yeah. who's a performance artist who teaches at UCLA, yeah. you know, who's hugely successful as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And has only ever, interestingly, had a monographic show in Germany. Huh. She's never had a solo show in America, ever. But she oh, had really? one at the Ludwig in Cologne. Wow. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Yep. That's She's a little a... too dangerous for Americans. Oh, I see. A little too political, a little too critical of the hand that feeds her. Oh, right. I Museums. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think she's uh, incredibly daring and relevant and uh, artful. Yeah, I think there is a lot of uh, responsibility in general. I mean, I don't think it's only in the art world, but um, how much responsibility we want to take. We, we are not raised and taught about taking a lot of responsibility for our actions in general. You know, I think that's a society problem. And um, I think it reflects onto a lot of things. You talk about uh, credibility in your book. And I was wondering if you can elaborate a bit on this in regards to how you see these um, women you interview build their credibilities. Street cred <laughs> is a term used in the English language. Um, and then there's kind of museum cred yep. and collector cred. Yep. And... Um, one could say there's various different kinds of credibility. And I think that the 
artists who feel most satisfied in the end are the ones that generate consensus of credibilities. Mm, interesting. So they're actually operating with regard to different constituencies yeah. and they're establishing their believability with yeah. curators, their believability with critics, their believability with collectors or patrons or the funders of museums um, and their believability with dealers, the kind of classic middleman, middle woman of the art world who connects everybody else. Um, and so there are very different kinds of believability at issue. Yeah. And it varies from curator to curator and institution to institution. But, you know, a lot of them are semi-academic, talk shop in a particular kind of way, which can be very jargony. Yeah. And um, have tension with their marketing departments. This classic thing that the curating department and the marketing department have tension mm -hmm. because the curators are kind of interested in their peers and interested in art history and interested in a certain kind of insider way of thinking about art. And then the marketing department is, well, how are we going to get a lot of feet walking through our museum? Mm -hmm. How can we speak this to the general public? And um, so, you know, there's, there are two different boxes to tick already with regard to museums as an institution. Mm. I think ideally you got to think in the round and try to be an all rounder. Now, maybe that's not possible for you. And you're going to be like, you know, the, the biennial darling. And, <laughs> and you know, yeah. the, the, the one that's got loads of credibility. One thing I find unfortunate is when credibility shifts, not because of the artist's content, but because, you know, somehow they've been really embraced by the public in general. And that means that they lose that je ne sais quoi for mm. insiders. Yeah, yeah. And I find that to be unfortunate because it's not, it's not like the content of the work has actually changed. Yeah. And um, I see what you mean. I mean, it was someone for whom that happened in an interesting way was Judy Chicago, Yeah, you know, who had a kind of certain very strong for a woman artist in her time um, credibility in the LA art world. And then she started working on the dinner party and the dinner party just broke out of the art world and yeah. spoke to a general public, yeah. particularly of women. And so you have like a double whammy effect on the one hand, she's not just speaking to the insider art world, which of course is very male dominated <laughs> and was then very male dominated and is still substantially male dominated um but then she broke out and there were you know it was a blockbuster exhibition in which there were crowds walk around the block to get yeah, in yeah. sf moma which opened the first dinner party was the premier of the dinner party they introduced timed ticketing for the first time they yeah. never had to have timed yeah. ticketing yeah. to get into an exhibition before and also the gift shop sold so many books and posters and it was the days before they had tea towels and silk scarves you know it, um sold so many things like that that the uh, gift shop was able to um buy a new cash register which they nicknamed judy nice i mean i like that so, story <laughs> it's great i actually was doing research and a guy who worked at sf moma who since retired told me that because yeah, so he nice, worked yeah. in like the back that's areas cool. of the museum back in yeah. 1979. So, you know, first of all, her feminism was a problem for the art world. And then her general popularity, yeah. general popularity was a problem. And it just meant it's almost like her general popularity allowed the art world not to take the feminism seriously. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's very interesting, this, uh, this comment, because... If you look at what you want with your art is you want to reach people. You want to touch them somehow. You want to make them think differently or, or open a little door somewhere that makes them question things and brings them a new perspective. It can be bringing them to see uh, something differently. So it is a good thing that a lot of people come. 
So it's very in contradiction with what it is to make art, I think. Ugh, how interesting is that? Absolutely. And it was a very large scale work. Yeah. It was conceived as a total exhibition, conceived as an installation, yeah. conceived also in terms of the details around the plates. And it's hard to find a post-war work of art with less ambition. Yeah. I mean, the ambition of that piece is astonishing. Yeah. And, um, and also the blockbuster qualities of the show. Hmm. And it's intriguing the degree to which the mainstream art world has tried to erase it. Yeah. And yeah. ironically, that's the main theme of the piece. <laughs> the erasure of great women from history <laughs> is the dominant theme in the piece, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. but I think, I think that's changing, thankfully. I mean, it's on permanent display at the Brooklyn Museum yeah. of Art yeah. and uh, Judy is having a resurgence. Although, you know, people of her generation, like she's 80 or people, let's say above 60, especially women above 60, really, I've noticed, have a trouble with her work. They're like, do like kind of terrified to look at a vagina I think you know oh. <laughs> interesting I know there are many exceptions to that so I hope I haven't offended anyone <laughs> so what would you say uh, is the most predominant convention uh, and, and or belief system in the art world today there are actually different conventions in different art worlds hmm. you know There's a lot of similarities, let's say, between the Berlin artist community and the Los Angeles artist community. But then yeah, again, yeah. there are a lot of differences. Yeah. I would say my impression, I've never lived in Berlin and I've visited a lot. I've never done really systematic ethnographic research in Berlin. But my feeling is that the pressure to conform to certain modes of behavior is intense. Huh, interesting. I find it, I find it kind of an intensely, I'd say conformist art world. Yeah, that's interesting you're saying that, yeah. And <laughs> I, I don't feel particularly free and liberated in what I'm allowed to say there. Hmm. I feel like there's a lot of rules about what's correct. Hmm. A lot of rules around commerce lot of rules around what's credible. It seems like it's very easy to lose your credibility in Berlin because it's a very judgmental crowd. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I were an artist, if I'd want to live there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love Berlin. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I yeah. mean, when I'm, you know, I would say, I mean, I lived in England for 25 years and I love Europe. And Berlin, I would put as one of my favorite cities, yeah. especially in April for Spargel season. I can eat, <laughs> I can eat asparagus for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I can. I mean, honestly, I can eat white asparagus every day for a week and and be thrilled. And then look at art in Rome, and you know the sun comes out and there's some blossoms and it's just bliss. I love Berlin in April. Yeah. But whereas LA also has its own. Um, its own rules and strictures around credibility. But for me, they feel looser. I think the fact yeah. that Holly, the Hollywood film industry is there, mixes it up a bit. It's also more sprawling. It's less, you know, like, you know, there are artists' neighborhoods, but they're kind of all over. There's something about that new world, California, spread out quality, which um, feels more open and porous. They're both oh, yeah. pretty, oh. they're, you know, they're both very international, Yeah. but they're international in different ways. Yeah. You know, I would say LA's in internationalism is Hispanic. So there are loads of artists from Latin America there and also Asian. Hmm. So, you know, you've got like Korean and Chinese Pacific Rim and, 
Um, of course, you have quite a lot of Latin American artists in Berlin, but Berlin is much more kind of pan-European mm-hmm. and into Eastern Europe. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Turkey and places like that. So, and certainly the Arab world. Yeah. Way, I would say many, many more Arab and Persian artists in Berlin than there are in, uh, conspicuously in um, Los Angeles. So, you know, when you get into the nitty gritty, there is a lot of difference. Hmm. As a writer in English, I, I feel like I could live in either place hmm. happily. Hmm. But as an artist, I... I, I would feel like there's more intense social pressure in Berlin than there is in LA. Mm. But I'm happy for someone to prove me wrong on that. And I do live in San Francisco. So that probably means I'm <laughs> a little biased. Um, so again, my apologies to, to, to listeners, but um, so I, 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 you know, there's a lot of different rules around behavior for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, and they change. They change all the time. I mean, when um, Jeff Koons arrived on this scene in the 80s, there was the artist uniform was kind of like jeans and T-shirts and black leather jackets and like at night in the winter, a black turtleneck. I mean, you know, there was kind of a beatnik look and he showed up wearing a business suit. Yeah. I mean, that was that changed. not done. Yeah. And initially, I think certain people couldn't take him seriously because of his clothing yeah and i think that's true with women too yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean you get out there and you show a lot of cleavage you're kind of saying um that's a that's an issue for women in all walks of life you know you're the ceo of a company and you show a lot of cleavage you're sending a mixed message mm. it's confusing to people mm. you're saying am i the subject agent you know who has power and is wielding it, or am I the object of your gaze? Yeah. Am I a passive um, spectacle for your pleasure? Hmm. You know, the, you, you, and of course women do do both, but it's tricky to pull off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say if you're a young woman artist, you're going to want to make sure that the premium is not looking pretty. I mean, sometimes I look at Instagrams and I'm like, oh my God. And okay, I'm 54 and, you know, you could call me like an old feminist or whatever. And maybe I'm like uncool, but I will see some young women artists and I'm like, are you trying to be a model here? Or are you trying to gain credibility as an artist? Yeah. Because I, I think this is confusing. Are you trying to get a date? Or are you trying to get a dealer? you know and and i'm like i don't know i'd i'd get the dealer maybe that's a new strategy yeah (laughs) you get the two in one it's easier (laughs) Uh, i would not advise that i would really not advise that it's you know it's interesting because one case study i found um always found interesting is the the case of sam taylor wood the british artist and Mm -hmm. video maker who was married to jay joplin the owner of white cube Yeah. So I actually think she's a very interesting artist. She was never taken seriously mm. because she was Jay Joplin's wife. And she still isn't taking ser- taken seriously. And so I would say, you know, be careful. Yeah. All this. Because rules, women huh? are very easily overshadowed. Yeah. And, um, the person with whom you're affiliated is relevant to your career because being an artist is an entire identity, not just a job. Hmm. And so watch who you fall in love with. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know what? Or amazing. examine it, examine it yeah. because who you fall in love with may tell you about what you really want in life and don't torture yourself to want two contradictory things or really think strategically about how you can have both. Yeah. But it's, but you, but you got to be really willing to fight. It's you amazing. Know? All this conformity and rules and it, it, we all created them. Huh? 
you know, that's the well, interesting we all, part. We participate yeah. in them. Yeah. And we recreate them anew every time we participate. In them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They can be very hard to resist, though. <laughs> I mean, they really can. How do you think we can elevate the conversation on, on women in art? I mean, on the, <laughs> the status, the... the The role, the... How can we improve women's stature in the art world? Yeah. I mean, give them shows. Yeah. Show their work as much as possible. Give them airtime. I would say exposure, exposure, exposure. Yeah. And I would say to women, don't be afraid of exposure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exposure for me is an important and good word. Uh, at least don't be afraid to invite people into the studio. Hmm. Don't be afraid to be open and honest about your work. Yeah. Do, however, try to speak from your most confident self. Yeah. I think in, in, in a lot of studio situations, women are much more likely to air their anxieties. Hmm. And, and, and I'm like, mm, save that for your confidants your best friend yeah so i would kind of find your strengths find the things you're most confident about and seek exposure there first yeah because you you talk a lot about uh, being believable as an artist if you don't have self-belief uh, how can you convince others to believe in you and your work yeah, yeah exactly the finding self-belief is the most important thing yeah i would say yeah And if you're not the kind of personality to be able to do that while out on a limb by yourself, then maybe another role in the art world would be more enjoyable and productive for you. Hmm. Yeah, especially when you say with your experience that women are much more reserved on to showing who they are and talking about their work. It's, it's all part of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a balance between like confessional autobiographical um, qualities and a certain kind of honesty about what really matters an honesty about your mission. Mm. And so I'm not saying, Oh, be all confessional and gushy. That's <laughs> not at all what I mean. I'm I'm like really, decide what you believe in and how you can attach your self-belief to a larger mission. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And so then that takes the burden off pure self-belief, yeah. right? Because your belief in yourself is in relation to your role with a larger mission, whatever yeah. it is. What a great discussion. I'm so happy I am able to share this with you. Please do not hesitate to write me any comments or suggestions. Thanks a lot and take care. Goodbye. On Display is produced by Raw and Radical, an inspirational movement, resource and community for women who want to be creative and live a creative life. You can find out more about the artists on this series by going to rawradical.com. Please leave us a comment and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It truly helps other people discover the show. Please visit us and subscribe to our newsletter to get updates and more goodies. I am Maren Brodbeck. Thanks for listening.